Hi everyone, welcome back to the Flying Monk talk show. And today we're very honored um, to have Ajahn Jayasaro um, come and talk with us. Uh, Ajahn is from the Thai forest tradition and many of you will have seen his films uh, online teaching many aspects of Buddhism. Um, he's also traveled very widely in Asia teaching the practice and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, could we begin just by, for those who haven't heard your story before, how you come to meet Ajahn Chah, your teacher, and how you come to the practice? Um, maybe go back a, a little bit to when I was at school. Um, I, I became interested in the question of what's a good way to live or what's the best way to live, or whether that's even a meaningful question, whether you can compare different ways of living and say one's better than another. Um, and I never considered that a religious quest or religious question, um, because I thought religion was about believing in things, and that I'd rejected that when I was much younger. So I started um, searching um, mostly through reading, reading books, and eventually came across teachings of the Buddha and um, that right from the very first page really it just made complete sense to me. I never had the feeling of some kind of exotic East Asian philosophy, it just a common sense. And um, in, in summary the, the conclusion that I came to was that the um, that we suffer and we create suffering for each other because we don't understand ourselves and the world we live in and that um, through practice of the Buddha's teachings, through the training or the education that the, the Buddha um, gave us, then uh, we can eradicate um, ignorance and craving and develop wisdom and compassion and that a life devoted to development of wisdom and compassion and then sharing that and helping others to develop wisdom and compassion um, is for, was for me the, the best kind of life. So that led me um, on a trek to, to India and also so at that, that age and that time when it was the great adventure to go overland to India. And so um, I spent nearly two years um, on that odyssey and um, mostly in India, but also spent time in, in Iran and uh, Afghanistan and uh, those places. And by the time I'd returned, what was I told my parents it was like a gap year. We had to become two years, and and I didn't want to do anything else except practice Buddhism. Um, but I wasn't quite sure how to to go about it. And um, I signed up for a meditation retreat in Kent <coughs> with a. a a teacher who had been a monk in Thailand for a number of years and uh, during his discourses he would tell us many stories about life as a monk in the forests of Thailand and I thought yeah this is what I've been looking for for the past two years so I, I decided to uh, go to Thailand become a monk and while I was preparing to go I heard that there was a group of Western monks who had trained in Thailand um, and we're now in London looking um, to establish a forest monastery here in England. And a friend said, well, you, should, you don't know where you're going or what you're doing. It makes sense to go and ask for some advice. So that's how I met Ajahn Sumedho, who was the senior Western disciple of Ajahn Chah. And I ended up joining his community and spending a few months um, with that community in, um, in Oxfordshire uh, before um, setting out to Thailand in November 78 um, and by that time of course I'd heard so much about Ajahn Chah that um, yeah, eventually and inevitably led me to um, arrive at Ajahn Chah's monastery in, in December 1978 um, and I've been in Thailand ever since. And when you arrived in Thailand you went directly to look for Ajahn Chah? Um, not exactly. Uh, firstly, the, I went 
on Aeroflot, and uh, they weren't such, I don't know these days, but they weren't very reliable, and I, I found out not only did I have almost no money, I had no baggage. And so I was, um, uh, while I was in Bangkok, I stayed in a monastery, and a monk said, you know, you're making a big commitment, you should at least um, go and see, take this opportunity to go and look at one or two other places before you go to, to Ubon. And so I went to, uh, up to, I thought that was a good idea, and, and I went up to Udon and spent some days with uh, Ajahn Mahabua, another of the great disciples of Jaman. Um, but in the end I decided that uh, I, I still, um, it was Udon that, that really drew me. And so uh, after ten days or so in Udon I went down to, to Udon, where Ajahn Chah was living. Mm. Had all of the practice the last two years before this prepared you for life as a novice in Thailand? Um, well, I, I used to joke that my standard of living rose slightly when I became, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd been living pretty rough, um, you know, as a hippie in India, you know, mm. and um, like at least uh, be sure of having a, a meal every day. And, and um, But no, I, I mean, I, I had been living very frugally and, um, and uh, over the past two years, been in many different countries and different environments, and so uh, was just used to adapting to um, unusual conditions. And and this was a special case because, you know, it was my uh, determination to um, to stay there. And, and and you know, I was twenty years old, but uh, I already felt like a kind of a, a veteran of. of world travel <laughs> and I, I, you know I'd done that I didn't need to go anywhere else now and, and I felt from the day that I met Ajahn Chah really yeah this is this is what I want this is what I want to do. Mm. There's many stories obviously of people's experience with Ajahn Chah mm. could you relate some anecdotes that bring to life his, his kind of unique teaching ability and skill? Yes I can but maybe I would also like to say that, that um, great teachers um, are now known almost like as in, uh, um, you know, like highlight reels, you know, that they have these anecdotes of teachers like Ajahn Chah, and Ajahn Chah is like this old man with a, with a walking stick and he walks up to you and he says something really profound, changes your life forever, smiles and walks off and that's, it's almost like a kind of a, a Disney um, uh, meditation master. Um, and in fact, when you're living with a teacher, that kind of experience is, you know, once in a blue moon, maybe. Mm. Um, and, but for me, um, particularly in the early year, early year or so, where you're really struggling to adapt to a very difficult climate and um, very harsh way of life, there's no electricity there. It's very, it's not only very hot, it's very humid, and uh, in days from three in the three in the morning till ten or eleven at night, you're only eating one meal a day, so it's physically. Uh, demanding, but for me it wasn't so much the great teachings, and of course to begin with I couldn't understand the language anyway, but it was just this strong confidence I had that this is an enlightened being, and that I didn't know what enlightenment was, but this is a bit of faith that arose, and, um, and the fact that um, Enlightenment is, is not just a, a story or, or something that was possible in the time of the Buddha. It's real, it's here, it's now, this is someone who's done it, someone who started off uh, just as an ordinary villager. And he, he used to, found out as time went on, that he was really stressed. Just, you know, he was just started off like all of us. Yeah. And he had, he was very honest about his problems and difficulties as a young monk. And he, he would say, uh, you know, I'm no different from all of you. The only, the only difference is I just stuck with it. I just, I was just patient. I just kept doing it. That's all you need to do. And that was very uplifting for for young monks. You know, it doesn't. He didn't want us to put him on a pedestal and he's the great master and and then feel you're so inadequate. You'll never be like him. But he's saying no. And there's a process involved. And I fulfilled. He never say that in so many words. But this is the you know, the conclusion. And you just do this and. And the way of life, the structure of the monastery, is such that it's it's set up to teach you, to, or to give you opportunities to learn. So, in some ways, you can say that the monastery was the teacher. Now, he set up things in such a way 
that you're constantly um, being confronted uh, with your own uh, defilements and the, the challenge of dealing with them effectively. So, uh, for me uh, and for many others, um, you know, every word he said, I remember, I, I mean, and he said, I, I was given the, the task of writing his biography um, uh, to be printed as the official and funeral volume um, at his fu uh, um, when he died. So it was a huge honour and responsibility for me, particularly as my Thai pro style was, you know, not, you know, not great at all at that time. I did a lot of research <coughs> and uh, interviewed many, many people, and of course I'd asked them the same kind of question. You know, is there any kind of um, uh, teaching that Ajahn Chah gave you, you know, that you'll you'll never forget or changed your life, or, or and that you'd like to share? And, and uh, so many times people say, "Yeah, oh, it was incredible." You know, I, I was just so uh, miserable. I was suffering and everything, and then. And then Ajahn Chah said to me, he said, it's all impermanent. And then just then, you know, it's like everything fell away. Or, and this, this was a common theme again and again. People's lives were changed um, by teachings which were written down would sound like cliché, Buddhist cliché first, you know, that how could those words affect somebody in that way? Um, and, and that's the reason why when you take those teachings out of context, sometimes you think, yeah, but it's it's all a matter of the relationship and the situation and and so many different factors involved whether or not the teaching goes to your heart. But with Ajahn Chah, you know, the the thing was you always felt that every word came from knowledge, experience. It wasn't just something that he read and absorbed and was passing on. Um, it, it and that's why um, his words were so powerful. Not because he had some profound special exotic, esoteric tips uh, that would turn your mind around. But he was often saying things that you'd heard elsewhere. Um, and, but when he said them, because of who he was, it was a whole different, a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. um, in the Thai forest tradition, obviously by its nature you live in the forest. You have this very close relationship with nature. Is that, historically, has that been an unbroken tradition in Thailand since, I mean, do people know the history of the, the tradition? Um, not really. Um, uh, partly this is, this is um, due to the fact that in the late 18th century, um, Thailand was invaded by Bur Burmese um, and they burned, destroyed, um, the capital city, Ayutthaya, mm -hmm. and so um, all of the historical records were destroyed. Mm -hmm. So there's a very scanty evidence um, of um, Buddhism prior to that. There, there, there are sources, but um, nothing really um, that you the same kind of uh, degree of, of um, detail that you get, say, in China or something like that. And also um, in Buddhist monastics, they're not really so interested in posterity or recording things. Um, um, so there's not that much information prior to mid 19th century um, when um, the the monk who we consider the founder of the, uh, the Northeast Thailand forest sangha. Um, appears on the scene, and he was um, uh, born in Ubon province, the same province as Zhejiang Cha, and um, he he was um, a singular monk in, in many ways, um, not just because he uh, he became enlightened, uh, which is um, unusual, but that he had um, a gift for teaching others. You find many great meditation masters, great enlightened masters, with maybe one Dhamma heir, or many of them with no Dhamma heirs. And there are many monasteries in, in Thailand um, built when a great master was alive. And when he died, everyone just went their separate ways. And now uh, those monasteries are, are like empty shells. And, um, but he, Ajahn Man, um, 
uh, was able to lead a very large number of monks and nuns to enlightenment. Um, and, and, and so uh, that his, uh, the Ajahn Man tradition was born, was another way of talking about the forest Taisanga and almost all of the great uh, monks and, and uh, figures in this tradition uh, looked to Ajahn Man as their root teacher. Um, Ajahn Chah um, actually only spent three days with Ajahn Man, and yet those three days, you know, stayed with him for the rest of the life, and to the extent that you know, he considered himself a disciple of Ajahn Man, and is recognized as one. So, um, you know, as we come into the uh, late 19th century, early, tw uh, early 20th century, then uh, increased communication, uh, more development, uh, more um, written accounts, and then um, from there, then we, we have the beginning of um, uh, recordings and, and audio, and, and so so now this tradition is quite well mapped historically. But um, to what extent there was a forest sangha before Ajahn Man? That's a question of, of some debate. Certainly, I think the um, it's it's. Um, Features would be somewhat different in that this this forest sangha, the, the present uh, Lumpu Man, Ajahn Man tradition dating back to the 19th century, um, was uh, influenced by um, a particular text, um, a text of monastic discipline, um, which was a translation of texts that were brought from, over from Sri Lanka. And that became um, uh, almost like the Bible for forest monks. So although there have been forest monks living in solitude, living with nature, meditating, um, this um, union of uh, a very strict meditation regime um, together with um, a very what we call precision or very precise and, and detailed um, practice of the monastic discipline, that was new. Um, <clears throat> but I think that uh, and before forest monks, uh, there are always um, uh, quite a strong um, tradition of psychic powers and of uh, empowering objects and, and sort of magical elements, I think, were uh, much more part of the mix um, prior to that. Those, those, there are still those elements today, but they're no, by no means as prominent as I think they were uh, before uh, mid 19th century. Is the Burmese tradition, considering it's been so cut off um, in recent times from the outside world, is it kept a um, stronger forest practice component? And is that any kind of window onto maybe the history of, of how, it, how it was passed on from ancient times? Um, I think uh, I don't have that much direct experience, so I'll give some, some impressions. Uh, one is that although the Thais and Burmese um, uh, you know, live, live close together, but the difference is almost like the English and the French. Uh, their, their, their personalities are very... Thais are very much more um, it's a Chinese, in a sense, very practical, pragmatic, and they're, they're not intellectual. It's um, it, uh, very rare to find a Thai person anywhere, or a monk, who, who enjoys talking about abstract things, about ideas. Whereas the Burmese um, are much more of an Indian, uh, sort of the two great cultures of Asia, India and Chinese, whereas the Thai are more like a Chinese culture. Uh, so then the Burmese are much more Indian speculative, uh, very uh, much more academic, intellectual, and so in the Thai tradition, I think it's a weakness that the the monks and forest um, have uh, traditionally not been strong academically in the, in the study of the Buddhist teachings, and the the academics and are not been very um, much into meditation. Uh, in in Burma, then or Myanmar, then the, the, I don't think that distinction is so clear. 
that uh, the two are harmonized much more. The, the standards of, uh, uh, in the monastic colleges are, are much higher. Um, but even in the forest monasteries, um, there, there is much more emphasis on the, the, uh, uh, the commentaries and that meditation teachings have to be uh, seen to be uh, grounded in the scholastic tradition in a way that's not the case in Thailand, which is like free and easy. And, and, um, <laughs> kind of, so in Thailand you have that kind of uh, creativity and orthodox yeah, kind of try things out in, in Burma it's a lot more, you know, you have to make sure that you're, whatever you're doing is in line with the books and can be defended on those grounds. Burmese um, forest monasteries, uh, um, I'm, I'm not really that familiar with the, the, the one which is probably most well known is, is Pao Monastery, it's very influential these days, but, but that's not really a forest monastery because there's so many monks it's more like a kind of a, a town in the middle of the forest almost there's so many um, monastics there. Burmese there are a lot of these um, technique um, based monasteries so with a particular technique associated with the teacher. Thai forest tradition there's not the, the you know there's not an Ajahn Man technique or an Ajahn Chah technique um, but the, the meditation teachings uh, of the Buddha are, are like different tools that to be used. You have a primary meditation object, usually the breath, but you would also have secondary meditation practices, particularly meditation on the unattractive aspects of the body, on death, on loving kindness, um, which um, are practiced at appropriate uh, appropriate times. So it's not like you you just apply one particular technique, um, and that's. Um, your identity is, is as a practitioner of this technique. That, that's not the case in my tradition. Uh, the Goenka approach and technique is, is I think, um, you know, a lay Buddhist, very good for lay Buddhists. It's very disciplined and um, you, you make a commitment and uh, I think people are very disciplined. Um, there is, um, I appreciate the emphasis on, on precepts. Um, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I've never practiced in that in that way. Where, you know, obviously, so um, I mean, I love walking meditation, and um, in in our tradition, we we alternate sitting and walking, and maybe some monks, some meditators, must spend hours a day walking, and I prefer walking to sitting, and and, and that's fine. So, personally, I'm. Um, you know, I wouldn't like a tradition where, where you don't have uh, walking meditation. Yeah. The other day you were, you were explaining about this um, using the imagination, especially for lay people. Mm. Um, could you just re kind of repeat the same kind of idea about the... Yeah. Well, I, I think, first of all, people, you know, we're, we're in a technique-obsessed age and, and people feel whenever they have difficulties it's, uh, it's a matter of tweaking a technique or discovering some special hidden technique and, and, and um, often it's approach and it's the way you apply them or the spirit with which you apply the techniques rather than the techniques themselves and and uh, uh, this obsession with, with details I think um, is often uh, missing the point and so whatever kind of um, meditation your technique you're using your challenge um, is to take the mind uh, beyond the five hindrances, these are the five defilements of mind which um, uh, will uh, crop up whatever kind of meditation you're doing. So there's a, um, just a obsession and interest and uh, in uh, thinking about things you like. Um, or then there's a second, so it might, it might be obviously from the coarse level of the spectrum as sort of sexual fantasies, but it could be anything uh, very innocent things that anything that you think about you enjoy thinking about it um, that's an obstruction to, to meditation getting caught up in aversion negativity and that can be from sort of boiling anger with someone to the slightest kind of move, revulsion movement away irritation that's that's a, a hindrance hindrance of stiffness dullness sleepiness 
um, of mind. That's a hindrance, and, and that's uh, these hindrances all have very subtle um, elements. So the, the sleepiness one is somewhat, you know, the course, you know, you're sitting there nodding backwards and forwards. But a lot of people um, develop meditation where, where they're quite peaceful, but there's a stiffness of the mind. Um, and that kind of subtle stiffness, rigidity of mind, that's the more subtle expression of that hindrance. Um, <clears throat> so the, 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 the mind which is well developed, uh, not only is it very firm and stable, but it has a pliability to it, it's got a workability to it. And one of the traditional similes is of like copper wire, which you can bend. So if you're very still, but it's kind of, it's like that. that. That's not that's not the samadhi. You see, uh, the fourth is um, is agitation, um, and also um, guilt and, and uh, regret about past actions, and just going over and over again about things you've done in the past. And so remorse, a recognition of something as being foolish. Um, and uh, wishing to, to put that behind you is not a defilement. But if you're just going, oh no, I'm such a bad person, I don't think that is. That's one of the hindrances. Um, and the fifth is, is uh, skeptical doubt. So that doesn't mean you, 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 um, you just have to believe in something. But it's more, um, when, you know, if you don't have sufficient information um, to make a judgment on something, um, then doubt is is um, expression of wisdom and intelligence. But if you have all the information that you need, and you're still going backwards and forwards because you're afraid of missing out, or you want to have some guarantee that you definitely made the right choice, or this is definitely right, and you're just um, going round and round in circles, that's that's a hindrance. So these five hindrances. Um, are the obstacles for meditators in whatever tradition, whatever uh, technique they're using. And the, the uh, meditation is, uh, should be one that seeks to take the mind beyond those hindrances. Um, now the point I was making the other day is that um, if you have a very busy life um, and, you, uh, and you come home and you, you can't really expect to switch from um, that kind of mental busyness and activity to a non-discursive meditation on, on the breath, for instance, and expect a smooth transition. It's, it's just too too difficult unless you're very um, you're experienced in meditation. And you can switch back to the forwards fluently. Most people can't do that. Um, some things you can do as a transition, you know, sometimes have a shower, uh, do a few yoga exercises, um, do a bit of chanting. These, these are things to, to create a sense of transition. But even so, uh, sometimes it's, the mind just rebels. It, it just wants to think, basically. So in that case, um, one skillful means is, is basically you say, to say, okay, you want to think, you can think, but we're going to think about uh, a particular theme. And um, one of the example I gave is, is um, imagining um, that you have the opportunity uh, to go and offer some food to the Buddha and his enlightened disciples, and and so you imagine you know, what what would, you know, what would you do? You'd get up in the morning, you know, or you'd have a shower. You'd want to be really clean, you know, and then what kind of food would you prepare? And just imagine yourself, just how what kind of care and what kind of you know you're chopping things up and cooking them. How mindful you'd be, you know, knowing this this food is going to be eaten by the Buddha and then the great disciples. Of and so you can, you can be creative. You can think. You can, um, you know, you can make a story out of it as detailed as you like. And then setting out, walking through the forest. You come to the cave and you're climbing up, and the caves candle lit, and there's the Buddha and, and all the disciples sitting there with their bowls. And you crawl up and you bow and and you, and you put the food in their bowl. And and so um, this this is saying. Okay, you, this, the thinking is just like, often it's just energy, you know, like, like anger and anything, it's just an energy. So you, rather than just going against it with a non-discursive breath meditation, you say, go with it, but, but, but channel it. And, and you channel it in this kind of way, you bring out all this emo positive emotion, you can be in tears, and that kind of joy in something wholesome and good 
can take the mind beyond those five hindrances in a way that hours of, of um, like Anapanasati might not do. And, and so this saying rather than have one particular technique, it's more a sense of, you know, you've got all these different tools that you can use and adapting them to, to situations, seeing what you really, what really need now. And um, when it's clear that the, uh, the, the challenge is to take the mind beyond these hindrances. So with, uh, if you have your primary meditation, obviously the breath, then the very simple, basic uh, way of dealing with hindrances, as you realize your mind's wandered, you bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And that in itself um, is um, incredibly meaningful and valuable thing to do. You know, you know, people say, oh, I can't meditate. My mind goes all over the place. You know, I just have to keep, and there it goes again. But yeah, but that's precisely the point. I mean, that's what you're, that's, that's what you're doing. And, and mindfulness is like a muscle. So every time you bring your mind back, you're strengthening that mindfulness muscle. And over the course of time, you'll notice the mind wanders off less often. You'll become aware of it more quickly, and you bring it back much more easily. And if you're very observant, you'll notice that that carries on into your daily life, where you're trying to concentrate on, on something at work or study or or whatever it might be, your mind is wandering off less often, you become aware of it more quickly, you can re-establish your attention more easily. And that's and observing that carry-on effect into daily life is what is what gives you the um, the inspiration and you know to keep 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 working at it. Um, but then uh, every now and again you find there's a particular um, kind of uh, problem that's coming up again and again and again. And, and in that, um, in that case, then maybe you put the breath down for a while, and you address this problem specifically. And uh, with the case of a lot of sensual desire, lust in the mind, um, to the extent that's really agitating the mind, then you 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 have the meditation on the unattractive elements, of the way to balance it out, bring the mind back to, to the middle way. Or if there's a lot of negativity in the mind, then do some loving kindness meditation. There's a lot, a lot of uh, laziness and reluctance, then uh, reflection on death. So, so you have these secondary techniques that you're applying when the usual basic practice of bringing the mind back is not working. Um, That's a really, really good point. It's really important. Um, before you talked about this. A thin veneer of uh, civilized, civilized behavior mm. that actually underneath often a lot of people who don't follow precepts it's, it can boil over into mm. quite unskillful behavior. Um, could you say a little bit about the importance of keeping precepts as a practice? Um, yes. Um, one of the things I mentioned is that. Um, Meditation where we're opening up and um, we're purifying the mind and it's uh, to be be able to do that, to be courageous enough to do that, um, you have to feel safe and, and, and monasteries you know, are uh, set up to be safe places as much as anything else. There's a place where you can go um, and feel protected and you don't have to be suspicious and, and uh, looking over your shoulder all the time and you know, you're surrounded by people who wish you well. And, and I think that in any community, if we, um, if we look at the, the underlying principles that um, are necessary for a healthy family or a healthy community of any kind, there are, a sense of safety um, is there, a sense of trust. Um, those are things that you know, we want safety, we want to feel safe, we want to feel we can trust the people around us. Uh, we want to feel respected. We want to feel loved. We want to be able to give love. These kinds of uh, qualities. So the, the Buddhist um, analysis is: Well, um, how do we how do we create those kinds of conditions? And the answer is that um, 
we're not too idealistic. We're saying, oh, we're all Buddhists now. We're just going to live together in peace and harmony, brothers and sisters. And, you know, because um, that's you know, it's unrealistic. Um, because we can't just decide as an act of faith or an act of will that now I'm just going to feel kind and, and compassionate for everyone. I'm never going to get angry anymore. You know, be, because uh, if the causes or conditions arise, anger will will result. Um, and and to feel guilty about that, or to feel that therefore you're a hypocrite or you're not really a good person, that, that's just foolish. It's just you know, according to causes and conditions. So we don't make our stand on mental states. Where we make our stand is on conduct, on, on action and speech. So we say, look, you know, um, I love you, you know, I'm really happy to be with you and, and, or in our family, you know, but, you know, every now and again, you know, you really make me angry, you know, and I, or I, you know, and I, I, that's, I, I'm working on it. But I'm, I can't promise you that I won't ever get angry with you or jealous of you or, or whatever, but I will. I can promise you that no matter how angry, I will never hurt you. I will never abuse you physically or verbally, that's my promise to you. And and that's that's something we can do. That's not, you know, idealistic Pollyanna stuff. We can do that. And if you're living with people and you all make that kind of commitment, wow, you can relax, you know. You, you don't expect, you know, that we're always, you know, looking at each other with eyes of love and compassion, but we know that we have this agreed standard and we feel safe. Uh, and we feel we can trust people. And, um, and 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 that sense of, of uh, safety and so that's so uh, actually fundamental to spiritual progress, progress in spiritual life. And not only do we need to feel that from the environment we're in, um, but also when we act badly, even if it's um, you know it's not. Uh, action that's going to result in, in imprisonment or, or you know, sort of banishment from the community, we, it, it registers, you know, and, and we can, we've got so many distractions in our life these days that we, you know, we can turn away from it and you know, overlook it and keep ourselves busy. But it, this moment that you, med you start meditating and you relax, it comes up. And it's, uh, and, and, and it's a real obstacle. Uh, to practice. And so I think if we're really observing what happens in meditation and the things that pop up, come up and uh, retard our progress, so often, almost always, it's something that we've done and we've said or should have done and didn't do or should have done. This. It's based on action and speech. So if we can be very careful and considerate in our action and speech, um, it just makes sense that we're reducing um, all uh, unnecessary obstructions to our to our practice. You know, meditation is hard enough as it is without creating all kinds of unnecessary um, uh, stuff and regret, remorse about our actions. And the uh, you know, in, in terms of how does Buddhism view self-esteem? You know, or what is self-esteem? How does it rise? So, a traditional Buddhist um, uh, response to that would be generosity and precepts. Those are the things that create self-respect. And more than that, you, you begin to like yourself. Because every time you give something, you're reinforcing the sense of, I'm a giver. You know? um, and and that sense of being someone who gives, someone who has something to give and to share on a conventional level, that's a very good foundation for, for practice. Because to, um, to push on in meditation, you really have to wish yourself well. Uh, you really um, need to be a good friend to yourself. But if you're, you're feeling that deep down, I'm not a really good person, I'm a, you know, bad, then uh, I don't know where you get the motivation from. So this is a reason. It's a gift. You know, you um, you may not have much money, or you may not have. You know, what can you give to the people around you? Well, the gift, the gift of harmlessness. You know, to 
to be to give a gift that people around you know that you would never hurt them, you would never steal from them, you'd never cheat them, you'd never abuse them. Well, and just that, and what, what wonderful thing to give to, to the people you live with. Um, and reflecting on your sila, going through, this is a meditation, going through the first precept, if you kept that well, and even you have cases where there was some pressure or some temptation and you, and you stayed with it, after a while this becomes also um, a, a meditation that brings up a lot of joy and uh, can calm the mind. Um, very, very uh, powerfully and easily. In terms of the difference between monastic practice and lay practice, is the potential exactly the same? I mean, do we as lay people have the potential to be arahants, for example, or is that just simply wishing too much and, you know, technically and practically speaking? Well, the, the um, if, we, if we look at the Buddhist teachings, I would call it like an education system or process, then um, then the Buddha, you know, to begin with, um, the Buddha even hesitated whether he would teach at all. You know, in, the, in the biography of the Buddha, he has this uh, Brahma Sahampati, this the Brahma God comes down and said, uh, uh, please, please teach, there are beings in this world who have little dust in their eyes who can understand and benefit. Um, and then the Buddha gave some thought to, well, uh, it's so difficult, um, there are so many obstacles, um, you know, uh, by what means could we reduce those obstacles or create um, the most optimum conditions for realization? And, and this is behind the creation of the monastic order. It's basically creating um, a little uh, community which is expressly designed uh, to optimize all of the supportive conditions for the path of practice and to minimize all the, the obstacles. So even though it's, it's still tough and difficult. But that, that's, that's basically it. it. This is a way of life structure which is designed by a Buddha uh, to enable people who, who, who want to make a, you know, a, um, a really sincere commitment to, um, uh, to benefit as much as possible from conditions around them. That being said, um, it was clear from the time of the Buddha that there were lay, uh, lay Buddhists realizing different levels of enlightenment. Um, most commonly the Sotapanna level, the stream entry level. And that would I mean, stream entry means that that's 90% you know, of the work is done. You know, it's, um, seven more lifetimes at most and they're all you know, going to be good ones. So it's um, good news. Um, the, the, there are few cases of lay, uh, lay Buddhists becoming arahants, and in almost all cases um, they became monastics. I would just think of kind of the obvious thing to do. And there's an interesting point because the, there are only two cases, three cases, where, the, um, where that didn't occur, and that was because they died before. Um, they could ordain, they were gored by, by bulls and what. And so, in the way that scholastic traditions were, this has become uh, a, uh, you know, a belief to the present day based upon a commentary that if you're a lay person, you become an arahant, you must ordain within seven days or else you'll die. <laughs> and so, it's, so, it's taking like two examples and making kind of a universal principle out of it. Um, but, uh, um, the, there are many Sotapanas who are leading a normal married life, um, having children, just living normal household life. Um, there, there are a number of Anagami uh, lay people, lay, lay men and women. Often they would lead a kind of a quasi monastic lifestyle as, as, as keeping eight precepts as, as lay people. The, um, Yes, yeah, so there, there is no bar to enlightenment um, through race or gender or age. Um, it's simply that the monastic order is, is created for people who, who are, have the opportunity, the, the free of the um, uh, responsibilities and commitments, and that, that they can give their whole 
their whole life to, to this practice. In fact, the Buddha said that you, 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 uh, you gauge someone's wisdom through, through talking to them. So that would... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think my training and the way I taught is, is, is like, say, my nair, you know, never, um, never be too sure about anything. So.